Our survey of the history of the interpretation of the Tanakh continues now with the earliest proponents of what comes to be known as source criticism. Uh, before we begin, it probably should take a moment to be clear about the terminology that we're using. Uh, throughout, we're going to talk primarily about source criticism. Uh, source criticism is a particular approach to understanding the origins of the Pentateuch, but it's also referred to by a number of other different names. Uh, so, source criticism is sometimes referred to as historical criticism. Historical criticism is actually a broader intellectual movement. Uh, source criticism is one particular theory of the origins of the Pentateuch within the broader framework of historical criticism. So, uh, sometimes authors will use the broader term to refer to the more specific theory. Uh, but we should be aware of that difference in terminology. Another phrase that's sometimes used to, as a label for source criticism is the documentary hypothesis. Uh, do the documentary hypothesis is one particular aspect of source criticism. It's not the entire theory, but since it, do the documentary hypothesis comes to be the dominant explanation of the sources of the Pentateuch. Sometimes that term is used um, as an alternate for source criticism. In the, somewhat, in the same way, uh, source criticism is sometimes referred to by as the JEPD theory. Uh, as we'll see, this relates to a particular uh, understanding of the way the so-called documents uh, who are uh, suggested by the documentary hypothesis come to be understood. So we see all these terms, historical criticism, documentary hypothesis, JEPD theory, uh, used as alternatives for source criticism. Uh, we're going to stick primarily to the term source criticism here. We'll use the other terms, particularly documentary hypothesis, uh, as uh, appropriate to refer to that particular theory about the origin of the sources. So our look at those who contributed most directly to the rise of source criticism begins with Jean Astruc. Uh, Astruc, uh, writing uh, mostly in the first half of the 18th century, was not actually a biblical scholar professionally. He was a doctor, a French physician, and also a professor uh, of medicine at several universities in France. But he comes to be known today much more for his contributions to biblical scholarship than to his reputation as a medical practitioner and professor. Uh, he writes a book in 1753 whose English title would be something like Conjectures on the original documents that Moses appears to have been used in composing the book of Genesis. Uh, he publishes it anonymously and, and in fact gives it a false uh, city of origin uh, of Brussels because he realizes that uh, he's going to be open to some criticism on the basis of this writing. Astruc's work continues to be in print, uh, to be circulated, uh, more on, as a matter of uh, historical position than because people are widely convinced that his conclusions about the origins of the Pentateuch are actually correct. Um, the ironic thing about Astruc's work is that he actually sets out to attack the more radical positions of Thomas Hobbes and Spinoza that we talked about previously, uh, and he actually wants to show that the Bible is not full of errors and inconsistencies in the way that Spinoza and others complained. He tries to establish this by saying that Moses employed two major sources in putting together the Pentateuch and up to ten minor sources in the process. He identifies these major sources on the basis of the divine name used by the author, Yahweh and Elohim. Uh, and he employs uh, the doublets that we have seen uh, established as a way of distinguishing um, sources by earlier writers. 
uh, and he associates the divine name of Yahweh with one and the divine name Elohim with the other. And these two uh, documents, these two sources, uh, the Yahwist and the Elohist, are his two major sources. And then he maintains that there are other sources as well. We observed that Asterix's intention had been to defend the Bible against the assertion that it contained uh, inaccuracies and errors. Uh, Asterix attempts to do this by arguing that what appear to be errors and contradictions are really things that were introduced in the process of compiling these documents together. And so after Asterix, the idea was generally accepted that there were multiple sources behind the Pentateuch uh, and that the differences arose as these original sources or documents were combined into the form that we have them today. So after Astruc, most of the debates among European, especially German academics, uh, centered on arguments about the number of sources, about the date of the various sources, and what criteria could be used to identify them. So Astruc makes an important foundational contribution to the development of source criticism. The next important commentator that we want to mention is Johann Simler. Simler, unlike Astrup, was a biblical scholar. He was a church historian, a study, a student of the text of the Bible, uh, and he wrote both widely and controversially about a wide variety of, of Old Testament and New Testament subjects. But today he's best known uh, for emphasizing uh, the importance of methodology. Uh, and hermeneutics to determine the original intent of the author, and this leads him to develop a couple of uh, principles that become important for source criticism as he goes forward. Simler argues that the interpreter should seek the meaning of the passage uh, exclusively in the understanding of the author and writer based on the language of the text and its demonstrable use. And that sounds pretty good, and I, I think that we would most people, most conservatives, would largely agree with that. Um, so it's not that uh, assertion that's the problem, but how similar implements it uh, within the framework of the presuppositions that he holds. In the seven, first half of the 1770s, Simler publishes a book whose English title would be something like Study of the Free Investigation of the Canon. Uh, in this book, uh, Simler argues that God works through human agents to communicate his will. That obviously, God used people to write the Bible, and these people so spoke a certain language, they operated within a particular culture, and so in the process of using humans to communicate his will, God accommodated his revelation uh, to the culture with which it was given. Again, there are obviously true things here. The biblical authors wrote in Hebrew. They didn't write in 21st century American English. You could describe that as an accommodation to the culture uh, of the time and place in which the biblical books were, uh, were revealed. But Simler takes it much further than that um, and uh, argues for, if you will, a much deeper level of accommodation between uh, God and the human authors. Uh, and as a result of his belief that there are uh, both God's uh, thoughts, if you will, and the human, uh, the work of the human instruments that produced, uh, that put those divine thoughts into final form, uh, Simler argues that it's the task of the interpreter to distinguish uh, those things that belong to the temporal context of the authors from the eternal and unchanging theological truths that are the substance of divine revelation. And so, <clears throat> for Simler, that eternal and unchanging substance of the divine revelation uh, is what he refers to as the Word of God. And that Word of God is that which bears witness to the salvation that God accomplished through Jesus Christ. And so for similar, uh, anything that doesn't bear fairly directly on 
the witness to how God was at work saving the world in Christ is a human element of the text, not a divine element, and therefore it's the task of the interpreter to distinguish those. So as a result of this view, Simler rejects the idea that the Bible is inspired, at least as it was historically understood, in the sense that the words themselves were inspired. For Simler, it's not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the big theological ideas that are inspired. Uh, and so uh, the words themselves are the product of the human authors, and they don't hold any special claim to authority. Uh, also, Simler observes that not all books of the Bible are created equal. They don't equally bear witness to what God was doing uh, leading up to and through the work of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, not only are the words themselves not authoritative, but the collection of those words into books is not at least equally authoritative throughout the Bible. So, uh, this leads similar to articulate two principles, as we've said, that come to be very important for historical criticism. The first of these principles is that we should treat the Bible like any other book. Uh, Simler makes this claim on the assertion that the Bible is written by human authors, uh, and that since it was written by human authors, it should be treated like any other book that was written by human authors. The second principle goes to his theological uh, presuppositions that we just articulated, that it's necessary to distinguish the Word of God, that is, witness to the gospel, from the words, the human words, through which that Word of God is communicated in the Bible. Now, let's lead us back to uh, the second of those big questions that we uh, mentioned in the outset of this series of discussions, uh, and that is, uh, how do we understand the relationship between the Word of God and the words of the Bible? So if we think of this in terms of a continuum, on one end, you have those who hold the view that the Bible is the Word of God, uh, that the words of the Bible are the words that God wanted to be written. And if that's the case, then the words uh, of the Bible are authoritative because they are what God wanted to be revealed. At the other end of the, that spectrum, you would have the view that uh, the Bible is simply human, uh, a product of human effort. It's the word of man, not the word of God, uh, and therefore it's not authoritative. If the Bible is a human document written uh, by humans and employing uh, methodologies and approaches that humans use to write, then it's merely a human document. It expresses the religious experience of the authors, but it does not have any authority for anyone else because it's simply a reflection of human experience of their life with God. There is a kind of mediating middle view here that the Bible contains the Word of God. This is in contrast to the traditional view that the Bible is the Word of God. You know, the, there are those who hold that the, there is Word of God there. It's not just a human document, but it is the Word of God within the Bible that's authoritative, not the Bible itself, not the words through which uh, you know, that capital W, Word of God, is communicated. And this is the view that Simler tried to articulate, that there is, within the words of the Bible, uh, which are merely human words, there is a divinely inspired truth, which uh, for Simler would be the gospel. Uh, and that divinely inspired truth is the only thing that's authoritative. So for Simler, then, the task of the interpreter becomes to distinguish the Word of God, the eternal truth of the Word of God, the gospel, from the temporal accidents, the, the words that the human authors use to communicate that divine and unchanging theological truth of the gospel. Uh, and so, for similar, the word of God is that which bears witness to Christ. Whatever does not bear witness to Christ is merely human, and it's the task of the interpreter to distinguish those from one another. 
Uh, these two principles that Simler articulates become critical uh, to uh, the way that historical criticism develops, particularly within uh, the churches rather than within academia. Uh, it is kind of Simler's version of the of the of of Arroway's doctrine of two truths. The next major contributor is Gottfried Eichhorn, a German scholar who was a biblical teacher and also a student of ancient Near Eastern uh, culture to the extent that it was known in his time. Uh, Eichhorn wrote, again, widely on both Old Testament and New Testament topics, and on the basis of the emerging knowledge of the ancient Near East that was becoming more uh, accessible to European scholars, Eichhorn emphasized the importance of myth to the study of the Bible and identified particularly the creation account as uh, mythological in nature rather than historical in nature. So Eichhorn sees Moses and his role uh, as one of attempting to elevate uh, Hebrew religion from a more primitive level to a more advanced intellectual level, which he believes was uh, represented in those days uh, by Egyptian thought. Uh, and, and here we don't have time to go into the history of the study of Egyptian religion and how it was understood. But Eichhorn, like many European scholars, saw Egyptian thought, particularly in its latter forms, where it's influenced more by Greek philosophical thinking, uh, Eichhorn sees that as an advanced, more elevated stage of religious development. And it was the task of Moses to try to elevate the more primitive uh, Hebrew religion into a more advanced state of religion that what had been influenced uh, through Egyptian religion. Uh, Eichhorn articulates his view of the origins of the Bible in his introduction to the Old Testament, written in uh, the beginning of the 1780s. Uh, in this book, Eichhorn applies the historical criticism that was becoming more common in his day across the Old Testament in a fairly consistent way. And he doesn't stop with the Pentateuch. He um, recognizes that if historical criticism is true, it doesn't just explain the origin of the Pentateuch. It has uh, the effect of requiring that the entire Old Testament has to be reimagined. It has to be re-understood on the basis of the changes in Hebrew religion that were happening uh, over the period of the time that the Old Testament was written. Uh, and so one of Eichhorn's major contributions is the recognition that criticism impacts not just the Pentateuch, but the entire Old Testament. As far as the Pentateuch itself is concerned, uh, Eichhorn standardized the criteria for source analysis, and by identifying and standardizing these, he sets a, he sets, uh, a pattern that will be followed by uh, other critical scholars after him. So uh, Eichhorn identifies uh, the criteria as, first, uh, the possession of a certain characteristic phraseology. Each source has certain phrases and ways of talking that it employs. Secondly, he says that it's necessary to identify the duplicates that uh, uh, so the doublets that uh, separate one source from another. Uh, thirdly, uh, in addition to just characteristic phraseology, there are differences in style of writing uh, and also in theological viewpoint. Uh, and also that each of the primary biblical sources has a distinctive vocabulary. And so, uh, harking back to earlier scholars uh, who identified, for example, the divine name Yahweh in one source and the divine name Elohim used by another. So the result of Eichhorn's work is fairly, I think, uh, recognized uh, to have produced the first modern work of Old Testament introduction, to the point that it still can be read and studied today. Uh, and its main contribution is the way in which it standardized historical critical practice, uh, and secondarily, the way that it extended 
the application of historical criticism beyond the Pentateuch to the rest of the Old Testament. Uh, Eichhorn is writing primarily as an academic and is not really all that concerned with uh, realizing, recognizing, or uh, even acknowledging the impact that these changes would have on the faith of the church as well. Our next contributor is Carl David Ilgen. Uh, Ilgen's doctoral dissertation was on the Septuagint. He then goes on to work uh, as a scholar on uh, the uh, whole question of the sources of the Pentateuch. Uh, and so he writes a couple of works of the documents of the Jerusalem Temple Archive in their original form, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, more significantly, uh, the records of the first books of Moses in their original form, published in 1798. Uh, in this book, the records of the first books of Moses, Ilgen identifies uh, 17 different sources of the Pentateuch. Of these 17, he argues three are major uh, contributors or, or authors or, or sources, uh, and the rest are you know, different levels of less significance. The three major compilers or writers of documents uh, that Ilgen identifies are uh, called by him E1, uh, because it uses, it, it's one, the first source that uses the divine name Elohim, uh, E2, uh, a second Elohistic source, uh, and then the J or Yahwistic uh, source. Now, um, Ilgen recognizes that each of these uh, has its own precursors, its earlier stages, and so he recognizes that the J source can be subdivi subdivided into uh, other sources, J1 and J2 as well, but those apply to earlier stages. Uh, at the main stage of three major sources, the Elohistic source E1, as Ilgen identifies it, comes later to be uh, relabeled the priestly source. And so we today identify it uh, as P or the priestly source rather than E1. And so, uh, as a result, Ilgen can be said to be the first scholar who identified a distinctly priestly source in the Pentateuch. Uh, and that identification of P, if you will, was Ilgen's major contribution. Another person that we want to mention or need to mention is Wilhelm de Vetti. Uh, de Vetti recognized something that others were not, had not so clearly articulated, namely that the rethinking of the way in which the Pentateuch in particular was written uh, requires, is not just a literary issue, but it requires a fundamental change in our understanding of the Old Testament books and their relation to one another and the impact that that has on the theory of how Israel's religion developed. And so Dewey saw conflict between these different biblical books that is resolved uh, as they are assembled together. And uh, this then forces a reconstruction of the history of Israel's religion uh, that is completely at odds with the biblical account of how that religion developed. And so, uh, in his work, whose English title would be something like Contributions to the Introduction of the Old Testament, written in the first decade of the 19th century, uh, De Vetti identifies what becomes a fundamental principle of all historical criticism, all source criticism especially, uh, from that time forward. Uh, and that is his belief that Deuteronomy is a separate literary work that is not connected directly to the rest of the Pentateuchal sources. He does this by employing that principle of consistency that we spoke of earlier. If every biblical author writes in a consistent way, then we must recognize that Deuteronomy is distinctive, inconsistent with the rest of the Pentateuch. Uh, it's teaching of a single sanctuary in particular. Uh, Duvetti sees as conflicting with the positions held by the other Pentateuchal sources and also by the later former prophets. 
And the reason for that is uh, that, according to Devetti, the Deuteronomy is not simply a later source, uh, not, excuse me, the Deuteronomy is not simply a separate source, but it's also a significantly later source. Uh, Devetti associates the writing of Deuteronomy with Josiah's reform in the second half of the seventh century. And so when in Second Kings we read that the high priest uh, comes to the king's secretary and says, I have found the book of the Torah in the house or temple of Yahweh, uh, Devetti actually understands that as referring to the moment when the book of Deuteronomy was written. In other words, that Hilkiah didn't find it. He had actually written it, or he and his circle had actually written it. And so that's how Deuteronomy comes to be associated with the period of Josiah's reform. And this association of D, or Deuteronomy, with the 7th century reform movement under Josiah forces a complete rewriting of the history of Old Testament religion and provides the chronological linchpin for the dating of the so-called sources of the Pentateuch, uh, because D can now be uh, definitely and directly affixed to one particular period of time. Uh, let me just say as an aside that uh, uh, there are very good reasons for disagreeing with Devetti, some of which are recognized even within the historical critical uh, school. But nevertheless, Devetti's association of D with Josiah continues to be uh, one of the most important elements uh, since it provides a chronological pinch, linchpin for dating the rest of the sources. Devetti contributes to other uh, critical understanding of other books as well. So, for example, he highlights the way that the Book of Chronicles is a kind of uh, Davidic propagandist uh, reactionary document uh, written uh, in response to the theological position of Samuel and Kings. Uh, Devetti also argues that much of the Pentateuchal material consists of uh, mythologically or otherwise uh, little fragments of tradition that get attached to a larger primary Elohistic narrative framework. So in this sense, Devetti can be described as one of the con founding contributors of what comes later to be known as the supplementary hypothesis, or perhaps the fragmentary hypothesis, although uh, in Devetti's case, the supplementary view is probably the more accurate expression of his own thinking. Uh, we have mentioned earlier that the term documentary hypothesis is sometimes used to refer to all of source criticism because it became the dominant view. But uh, the documentary hypothesis is just one of three theories that held sway uh, in the first part of the 19th century. You had the documentary hypothesis, what we today call the fragmentary hypothesis, and what we would today call the supplementary hypothesis. Now, the differences are basically these. The documentary hypothesis holds that the Pentateuch was constructed by editing together three primary documents. So these parallel primary sources were edited together to form the Old Testament, uh, the Pentateuch, particularly as we have it. The fragmentary hypothesis uh, argues that there were not three parallel major narrative sources. There were simply a lot of fragmentary beliefs and traditions and scraps that were written down and that someone came along and took all these scraps of uh, traditional religious material and kind of edited them together and created out of them uh, a narrative. And so these independent small fragments uh, get artificially combined to create an artificial story that we know as the Pentateuch. The third of these theories, a supplementary hypothesis, is the view that there was kind of one major narrative source and a lot of other secondary material gets added to that source. So the Pentateuch was comprised not by a mixture of parallel sources, but by taking a lot of secondary material and adding it to one primary narrative framework. <laughs>
And that's the view that's most often associated with Wilhelm de Venti. But it's not the view that became the dominant one. Uh, for that, uh, we have Hermann Hupfeld to thank. Hermann Hupfeld was an Orientalist, a study of pseudo-ancient Near Eastern religions and culture and history. He was also a Hebrew grammarian and a solid biblical scholar. In the middle of the 19th century, he wrote a book called The Sources of Genesis uh, and the Nature of Their Composition. And in this book, uh, Hupfeld brought together the arguments that led to the widespread acceptance of the documentary hypothesis over the supplementary or fragmentary hypothesis. So Hupfeld's, uh, Hupfeld argues that there were these three original documentary sources uh, and that the priestly source, or the earlier no source earlier known as E1, was the foundation document for the Pentateuch, the Grundschrift, uh, because as Hupfeld sees it, the genealogies and the chronology provided by the priestly material provide the basic chronological framework for the Pentateuch as a whole. And so it is the uh, chronological or historical foundation uh, of the Pentateuch. But it also is the foundation document because the, the bulk of the laws and the legal material that make up the heart of the Pentateuch, you know, in the latter part of the book of Exodus about the tabernacle and so forth, and in the book of Leviticus as it relates to the sacrificial system uh, and the way that some of this reemerges again in the book of Numbers, um, all of this legal material is found in the priestly source and therefore is a, you know, a foundational importance for the way the Pentateuch is constructed. The third argument uh, that uh, Hupfeld has for the early priority of P is the many examples of ancient language usage. And so on a linguistic level, he says the priestly source represents the earlier stage of the development of Hebrew literature. And so it also, uh, that also becomes an argument for its priority in a historical sense. So putting all this together, Hupfeld develops uh, the classic early form of the documentary hypothesis. Today, we refer to Hupfeld's approach as the old documentary hypothesis because it will shortly be supplanted by a new version of this theory. But Hupfeld's explanation went like this. If we think in terms of timeline. We get the priestly source, uh, which dates to about 1,000 to 950. Uh, that is, uh, it, he sees it as having been uh, having its origins in the first temple and its cultus and the priesthood of the first temple. Uh, according to Hupfeld, this priestly document contained a basic core narrative uh, that also had genealogical material and legislative material and chronology associated with it. Uh, and it's this priestly material then that provides the foundation for uh, the rest of the Pentateuch as it develops. Uh, the next major document was uh, a, a document that used the divine name Yahweh, and so it comes to be known as the Yahwist or the J source. This uh, is just the narrative of the Pentateuch. It doesn't contain the legal material or uh, the genealogical material. This basic narrative of what God had done employs the name Yahweh, and so it's the Yahwistic version of this narrative, and he dates it about 850. Uh, another version of this narrative is developed uh, about a century later that is essentially the same, although it has a distinctive theological perspective, a slightly different theological perspective, and it uses the divine name Elohim instead of the divine name Yahweh. So we have the priestly source, around 1,000 to 950, the Yahwistic source about 850, the Elohistic source about uh, uh, 750, and again, this employs basically, uh, this tells basically a different version of the, of the main narrative that's told by the Yahwist. Uh, then the next document is the Deuteronomist, uh, dated in relation to Josiah's reform, so sometime between, say, 650 and uh, 620. 
or, or thereafter 625, 621 are common dates associated with it. Uh, this is different from the others because it's primarily speeches uh, put in the mouth of Moses. So it's a different kind of literature. Uh, it does have narrative interwoven with the speeches, uh, but the main thing about Deuteronomy is that it has its own set of very distinctive theological themes that differentiate it from the rest of the Pentateuch. And this is associated, as I, we've said, with Josiah's reform around 625 or thereabouts. Uh, and then during the exile, uh, all of these uh, sources get edited or brought together over a period of time during the exile and in the post-exilic period to create the Pentateuch that we know today. So that's a quick look at the rise of source criticism and the origins of the documentary hypothesis as the dominant explanation for the sources that are combined over time to evolve into the Pentateuch as we have it.